But let's get into God's word now. Mark chapter eight, and I'm gonna say one last prayer and ask God to give us fertile and humble soil that his word might find place and that it might produce fruit. Lord, we do that now in Jesus' name. We lean into your word. Lord, we're here together to receive from you. We're the family of God. We're here at the noon service. Thank you for the announcements and for the time of worship and for the time of fellowship and communion. May we now continue to grow, Lord, by the power and preaching of your word. May it not, Lord, return void, but may it return fruitful. Change us. May no one leave here today the same way they came in, by the power of God, for the glory of God, and the people of God. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, read with me the last verse of chapter seven. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, he's done all things well, and he makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Stop right there, eyes up here. Jesus now has been ministering to the masses and they've joined him and they brought to him a man who couldn't hear, therefore he couldn't speak. And so Jesus grabbed that man and put his fingers in his ear, spit on the ground, touched his tongue and all of a sudden his lips were loosed, his ears were unplugged and he began to speak plainly. What? And the people were astonished beyond measure. What does that even look like to be astonished beyond measure? Maybe it was what the Ducks fans looked like last night when we finally won the game. Like, ah, you know, man, that was close. Or maybe, I don't know, sorry, bad illustration. But maybe it was something, they were freaking out. And I would say that to say this, this is the goal for people who've had their ears open and their mouths set free, and now they're living differently. The people around you should see some difference and be astonished. There should be some sort of wondering, what's different about you? You were all messed up, all jacked up, all tipped over. You couldn't do anything. And then all of a sudden, Jesus touched you and changed you. That's exactly it. And now my life has never been the same. And in the King James Version, it says that the deaf speak and the dumb hear. He says that, he calls it dumb in this way, the dumb speak and the deaf hear. And I'll tell you what, that miracle's still happening to this day. I'm standing up here and I'm pretty dumb and I can talk. And you guys, without his spirit, you guys are also deaf, but you hear the word of God. And the truth is, for me to speak, for you to speak, for me to hear, for you to hear, it's a miracle of God he's done the same thing. I don't take that lightly at all. To have a soft heart towards the Lord, to have a willingness and a readiness to be used by the Lord, it's a miracle. And Jesus is doing this in the Decapolis. Deca means 10, Apolis means like a metropolis city, 10 cities, and he's doing it on the eastern, southern hemisphere of the Sea of Galilee. This would be the Roman area where the Gentiles dwelled, where some Jews had congregated with Gentiles and they established a Rome away from Rome colony. And Jesus says, let's go there too. And I wonder if the disciples that were following Jesus were kind of walking around on their tiptoes, like, ah, oh, Gentile country, Gentile country. They didn't really want this to happen. And Jesus said, let's go heal some people. Let's go minister to some folks. Matter of fact, setting the stage with all of that, look at verse one of chapter eight. In those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and he said to them, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their own houses, they will faint on the way for some of them have come from afar. Verse four, well, then his disciples answered him and said, well, how can one satisfy these people with bread here in the wilderness? Stop right there, eyes up here. Jesus once again, amassing a crowd of people, hungry students for day one, day two, and day three, they've been learning from him. And now Jesus has to make this distinction and qualification to his disciples. I have compassion on these people for they've been with me for three days and they're all hungry. And if I send them away, they're gonna faint on the way. So he looks to his boys. This is what we're gonna call a teachable moment. He looks to his disciples as if to ask them, what do you guys think we should do? They answer, how can we feed these people in the wilderness? In my Bible, I've circled the word these. I don't know the tone. I don't know their visage when they said this. Something in me though says that the disciples didn't really like where they were at and they just wanted to move on. They're on the eastern side where the Gentiles were. And Jesus here has to make a distinction. He's like, hey, in case you boys didn't notice, I love these people. I have compassion on them. I'm, I'm concerned for them. And I'm wondering how we might feed them. And the disciples' instant reaction, I don't think we should feed these people. You know, have you thought what this was gonna do? <laughs> Probably a bad idea. 
And this is, again, one more opportunity for Jesus to teach his students something. How many of you guys are a student of Jesus right now being taught something? Anybody feel like you're being taught? Like I'm a student every single day. It's like I haven't learned anything. Do you ever feel like you just haven't learned anything, like you're starting all over? How many guys are students learning something, but even more so, how many guys feel like you're in the principal's office all the time? <laughs> you know, like, I'm for sure a student, but I feel like I'm also in trouble. Man! Jesus, he's the master teacher. He's the master shepherd. He's the master carpenter, and he's making into you and me something that we're not. And I believe when Jesus says, look, I have compassion on these people, it's because they did. Now, why didn't they have compassion? Maybe it was weariness. These guys were on an aggressive pace. We talked about that last week. When you get weary, when you get overwhelmed, when you get discouraged, when you get tired, do you find that your compassion wanes? You're just a little less empathetic, a little less sensitive. You're like, dude, figure it out. Stop being a baby. You know, those are some things that come from my mouth sometimes. Maybe I don't say it. Maybe my face says it. And in my weariness or my exhaustion, I'm just not so patient, not so open, not so available. We get peopled out sometimes. And you know what? The Lord wants to test you and test me. You're gonna get peopled out tomorrow, maybe today, what are you gonna do? I think it was Friday and I had an aggressive schedule and I got up early and was at the airport in Kauai and got on a little plane to Honolulu and I was sitting there in the middle. This isn't the middle the worst. I'm sitting there in the middle and there was a guy on my left. He was a big guy. He took the armrest and all the stuff and he had headphones on and two phones and he was on his cryptocurrency on one phone and fantasy football on the other phone. He was all dialed in and, and then the lady on my right, she had a mask on. She was in her 70s, you know, and, and she's doing her own thing. So I pulled out my Bible. I was like, okay, I'm just gonna kind of dig in here and just kind of read Acts or Romans or Mark chapter eight and I'm reading and I noticed this lady next to me. She kept kind of leaning over and checking out my book a little bit, so I was showing it to her, you know, and finally, finally she took her mask down and began to engage me in conversation. Her name was Loretta. She's flying back to Los Angeles, and, and then slowly but surely, she reached under her chair, and she grabbed her Bible out of her bag, and she wanted to show me her Bible, and she was so proud of it and told me her story, and if I'm honest, though, I was peopled out. I started reading on purpose. Leave me alone, you know, <laughs> and yet the Lord said, Luke, I want you to encourage Loretta and I want Loretta to encourage you. And it was so encouraging. Helped her get her bags off the plane. And I said this, the last words I said to her, I said, Loretta, I said, we're gonna hang out together forever. I'll see you, I'll see you when I see you. We made a connection. Well, I'll, I'll, we're gonna hang out forever. And yet if it wasn't for the kingdom of God, it wasn't for the spirit of God, it wasn't for the ways of God, man, people wouldn't do that. We're not into that. We don't have, maybe we get weary. Maybe we get selfish. I think selfishness and weariness can go hand in hand. I just don't have enough of me to give away anymore. I've been given, given, given. I got, I got to hold some back. I just don't think I'm going to have enough for myself anymore. And I tend to put a cap on my love, a cap on my availability, a cap on my patience. Maybe it was weariness. Maybe it was selfishness. I suggest it could have been both of those in addition to maybe it was also prejudice. Maybe these guys just didn't want to love this people group because they were different than them. And they knew that this was breaking the rules. That's exactly why Jesus took them there. See, Jesus loves to take our linear thinking, our straightforward thinking, our box theology, and this is how it's always gotta be, and this is how it's always, got, always been. Jesus loves to blow that stuff up. He loves to get us outside of our comfort zone. He loves to take us deeper and to make us into better men and better women. See, we tend to think pridefully that God is frustrated with the people that we're frustrated with. Yeah, I'm frustrated with that group. That group over there, I can't believe that group. And we look at God, can you believe that group? And the Lord says, yeah, I love them. What? What? I was going to say a couple of groups, but I decided not to. Look, you, you love them? I don't want to get in trouble. And we tend to think the Lord loves the groups that we love. And he says, look, have you read the Bible, son? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him would not perish. Some of you in your Bibles or your working theology next to world and whosoever have asterisks written right there. For God so loved the world. Well, <laughs> you're not on the world. And all whosoever would call upon him. <laughs> can't be everybody. That can't be the case. You see, Jesus had just fed 5,000 men, not counting women and children, in Galilee, in Judea, where the Jews were. And it made sense to them. Now they're in the Decapolis. 4,000 men and women are here. And I just wonder if the disciples, there's no way you're going to be kind, generous, and benevolent to this group. That'd be crazy. And the Lord says, hold my Bible. <laughs> That's funny right there. <laughs> You guys get it? You'll get it at lunch. It's pretty funny. I didn't say that at the other two services, but I should have. The Lord says, watch me. Watch what I do. 
And I believe, again, he's teaching them a lesson. Whether it's weariness, whether it's selfishness, or whether it's prejudice, what Jesus is gonna teach these boys, that whatever you have, whatever God's given to you, he's given it to you in order that you might be a steward used by him to give it back to the people around you. Time, talent, treasure, days, dollars, deeds. We argue, we protest, we analyze, we scrutinize, we categorize, Lord, I only have so much. I, I really, I'm on a budget. Like, I really don't have enough time for these people, and we don't have enough stuff for all this group. And he says, really? Where did you get all that stuff in the first place? <laughs> well, it, all good things came from you, but have you thought about the consequences of just continuing to give, continuing to serve? And I believe these questions are gonna continue to surface in our life every single day in the classroom of life as God teaches us to trust in him, and to do the next right thing. Jesus, number one, says in verse two, I have compassion on the multitude because they've continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. Stop right there, eyes up here. Are you impressed a little bit with these people? All day long, they're receiving from Jesus. Night is falling, there's nowhere to go. Like, can we just, can, can we sleep here? Start again tomorrow? Is that okay if we start again tomorrow? Let's start again tomorrow. And they go to bed, they wake up early, give us some more. And Jesus gives them more. Day two, can, can, can we start again tomorrow? Sleep here, right? Three days of this. Man, you and I are such babies when it comes to seeking the Lord. Have you ever showed up to church before and there's no parking spots? You're like, well, I guess I'll go to Pig and Pancake instead. You know, like, I tried, I tried. <laughs> or you ever set your alarm early in the morning, like, I'm gonna get up a little bit before work and I'm gonna seek the Lord and your alarm goes off at 1130 like always, you know? I'm just kidding, that's a joke. <laughs> it's too hard to get up and... Man, we're, these guys are incredible. And I wonder if that's what spurred Jesus' compassion amongst other things. He is the compassionate savior. But he saw these guys and goes, they were thirsty and hungry and desirous of the things of God. He wasn't just gonna kick them out. And maybe there's a linkage there to some of the things that God gives to us or abstains from giving to us based on our hungers and our thirsts. You ever wonder why you don't get stuff from the Lord? Man, I just, I just thought, I thought I'd have more revelation and more insight and, and more things. And the Bible says to you and me in the, Sermon on the Mount, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And I'm not talking to you, I'm talking to me. Sometimes the Lord says, Luke, I notice you're not really hungering and thirsting for the stuff of God right now. You're going after other things, that's for sure. But if you really knock, seek, and ask, you will receive. These are the principles. These men, these women, these children, they've been knocking, asking, and sinking, and Jesus says, do not sinking. They've been seeking, and now Jesus said, let's feed these folks and give them the stuff that they need. He says, if I send them away, they're gonna faint. The disciples protest, how can we feed these? Verse five, let's continue the story. He asked them, well, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven. So he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves, and he gave thanks, number one. He broke them and gave them to the disciples, to set before them, number two, and they set them before the multitude, number three. Stop right there, eyes up here. We've seen the story already, a different time, different situation, different circumstances. And now he's repeating it. Some scholars actually, when they read this, they say there's no way that this happened twice. There's no way, this is the same story just told wrongly. And they say that there's contradictions in the scriptures, that's crazy. Jesus actually makes the distinction of these two separate events. And the reason why scholars can't believe that he did 5,000 one day, and then 4,000 at another time, they can't believe that he would actually do that. The reason they don't believe it is because the disciples had forgotten evidently that the 5,000 already happened. And they're like, there's no way that they forgot that God was so generous and provided for all their needs that it just slipped from their memory. And yet, how many times have you forgotten in a moment of need and distress? Like, oh my gosh, the bills. Not the Buffalo Bills. Oh my gosh, the bills, you know, they're coming, coming in. And they're stacked up. And, and, and this is, and, the, and the, the, my kid needs braces now. And this is happening. And all this, and the Lord's up. And I go, no way. Have I ever provided for you before? It's like, well, yeah, every time. What's changed this time? You and I are such spiritual amnesiacs. It's crazy. We wake up every single day. Ah, there's more needs. And the Lord says, hey, my bread for you, my manna, my daily bread is sufficient. Notice what Jesus does. Though. There's a few contrasts between this story and the previous 5,000 feeding. Jesus asks them, what do you guys have? What do they say? We have seven loaves. Previously, they didn't have anything. They had to go find a little boy with five loaves and two fish, and they brought him. They said, we don't have anything, but we found this kid's stuff. Maybe you can take his stuff and distribute it to everyone, just like the government does. They find somebody's stuff and distribute it to everyone. And I'm just kidding. Am I not kidding? I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. It's true. 
And this time, there's nobody to give their food except them. It's a little different. It's actually not hard to give away somebody else's stuff. Now they're asking the disciples, what do you guys have? Uh, well, for these people? I mean, now they ask. Like, we, we, we have seven loaves of our own. We were gonna, we were, you, you want ours for them? Seriously? <sighs> and so they give the seven loaves and Jesus said, thank you. Now notice what Jesus does. And this is what I would suggest we all do every single day. He takes what he has, seven loaves. It's not enough, but it's what he has. And he gives great thanksgiving for it. I believe that each and every one of us, if we spend a little bit of time every day just looking at what we do have, not at what we don't have. You guys wanna talk about what we don't have and what we need? Oh man, we're gonna need some Advil by the end of that conversation. That's not a fun conversation, what we need and what we don't have. What's an incredible conversation is what God has given to us thus far. Do you remember when you were born? Remember? No, no, because you're dumb. You weren't even there. You, you know, born. Not only that, but you came out naked. You came into the world with nothing, making a mess of everything. That's how you started this game. And then someone took care of you and slowly put you together and you became a producer and other things. And all of a sudden you came in with nothing. Now you probably have something. Does anybody in here have something? I've got something. I got some clothes. I got a lot of clothes. I got all kinds. I came in with nothing, but I'm fully clothed. This is legit. Not only that, but you didn't have any cars or houses or bikes or backpacks or toys or gadgets. Most of you have some of those things now. Some of you have lots of those things. Wouldn't it just be so radical if every single day you're a dude, I'm so grateful for this stuff. Where did it come from? It's not enough for my future. I got plenty of worries. Don't go there. Thank God for what you do have. And then maybe even look down and say, Lord, did you give me any of this stuff so I could be a distributor, so I could give away the things you've given to me? And then see, we're gonna see in the story, you give me even more stuff as long as I continue to give it away? Is, is that what you, is that the lesson? Or are we gonna fall into the American dream? You guys have heard this before. The American dream is to get all you can, can all you get, and sit on the can. And just do it wrong. And the Lord says, no, I, don't, I wanna use you as a funnel. So he asks the boys, he's taking them on this next lesson. What do you have? We have seven loaves. He's like, perfect, give it to me. And he thanks God for it, blesses the Lord, and then distributes it back to the disciples. Isn't this just kind of weird? They gave everything they had to the Lord. Thank you. And he gives it right back to him. Like, okay, was that a necessary step? Do we need to do that? Absolutely, you need to do that. Gave everything to the Lord. And the Lord gives it all back to them. Now they have exactly what they began with. We still only have seven loaves, but now the miracle begins. And the Lord says, I want you to have compassion like me and go serve other people. Go break that bread. And as they began to do so and distribute, which by the way, God has chosen, principally speaking, to not distribute his wealth, resources, his love and forgiveness without our help. When Jesus died, when he was blessed, when he was broken, when he was divided, when he rose from the dead, he then commissioned us and said, now you go into all the world and proclaim the gospel, teaching people my commandments, baptizing them in my name. Listen, forgiving them of their sins. What? That is radical. I've done it all. I'm broken. I'm blessed. Now you go tell everybody. You do it. You're my ambassadors. I want you to do it. And how many of us take what God's given to us, make it our own? Like, thank you for giving me that. Thank you for loving me. I might tell some people someday if I, if I really get around to it. And we love the gospel and the good news and the forgiveness and the provision and the love. Man, we got so much of it. And the Lord says, oh, I, I put you on planet earth next to your neighbor and at that place of business and in this friend group on purpose that you would be the richest person among them and the most generous with the gospel that I paid for and gave to you. And this lesson's being taught to them. They're gonna blow it. I forget, I miss it. I'm so encouraged that these guys also needed many, many lessons given to them. And they began to then distribute it. I'll look at verse seven, it's kind of interesting. They also had a few small fish and having blessed them, he set them also before them. Stop right there, eyes up here. I don't know how the timing of this really worked, what do you guys have? Seven loaves, he gives them the seven loaves. Thanks God, gives them back. They start to distribute and the loaves begin to multiply. And maybe somebody noticed, no way, this is crazy. Hey, get the fish too, get the, fi get the fish on there too, you know? Let's see if he does the fish too. Like, why didn't we give the fish in the first place? I don't know, because we're weirdos. You know why they didn't give the fish too. And God's so gracious, Jesus is multiplying, like, oh, we, we, we got some fish too, you know? I don't know if that's how it went. I don't know. The timing seems sus to me. <laughs> and so the fish now are blowing up. Look at verse eight. So they ate 
and were filled, and they took up seven large baskets of leftover fragments. And now those who had eaten were about 4,000, and he sent them away. Stop right there, eyes up here. This is crazy. After the fish and after the loaves went out, they all ate and were filled. The word there, filled, means glutted. These guys had so much to eat. This is like going to hometown buffet and you need like a cane to get out the door and there's a doggy bag oh, and they're burping and they're belt. There's so much food. Not only was there so much food that they had enjoyed, but the Bible says they had seven baskets full. Now, just a quick Q&A. How many baskets full did they have at the first miracle of provision? 12, one for each of them. The word basket in the Greek in the first miracle indicates a basket about the size of a KFC bucket, just kind of one of those like personal buckets. You know, when you get your own chicken, you get your own bucket of chicken. Is that how you guys do it? Anyways, they had their own little personal bucket. This word for basket in the Greek is a totally different word. It's a basket that's the size of a man. It's the same basket they used to put Paul outside of the walls of Damascus when they were trying to kill him. It's a Gentile word, not used necessarily in Jewish settings, but that's where they were, Gentile country. And instead of 12 small baskets, they had seven man-sized baskets. There's even more food and provision in this, listen, secondary miracle that was primarily for Gentiles, for people on the outside looking in, for people that were easy in that time to overlook. And I wonder if all of this just speaks at the Lord's heart and how he wants to bless people, how he wants to use us to bless people. And we have all these hurdles and stipulations of weariness and selfishness and prejudice, and the Lord says, hey, I'm gonna give you a few opportunities, maybe a few dozen, maybe a few hundred, maybe a few thousand, to learn these lessons. And I would imagine the disciples with three years of King Jesus teaching them daily, that they would have learned more and developed quicker and been better, but they didn't. Even on the very last day, their graduation day at the Last Supper, they all betrayed Jesus, they all fell short, they all missed the mark, which encourages me greatly that the Lord is patient with you, patient with me, wanting us to learn these things day in and day. Look at verse 10, we're gonna finish the story, we've got a couple more verses. Immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and he came to the region of Dalmanutha, which we don't know where that actually is. We imagine it's part of the Decapolis in that Gentile area. I do think it's awesome how Jesus, after doing this miracle, he's been there for three and a half days. He feeds 4,000 men plus women and children. They're not even numbered. All this, they have a bunch of food left over. He's like, all right, guys, let's go. Wouldn't you be tempted to stay there? Like, are you serious? We have seven baskets of fish and chips. We're gonna open up a Moe's restaurant right here, bro. It's going down. We get so tempted to kind of just make things better when the Lord, and the Lord just says, let's go. I think there's an important capacity within spirit-filled believers to stay on mission while remaining flexible. Sometimes we don't stay on mission, and yet we're flexible, we're all over the place. Sometimes we become inflexible, we stay right where we're at, and we fail to be on mission. Jesus was both flexible and on mission no matter where he went. This is amazing. And maybe you need to stay right where you're at, and don't adjust and don't move in that ministry that God's called you to, but you need to make sure you're on mission, because it's easy to spin your wheels. Or maybe God wants you to stay on mission, but it's time to get in the boat and, and go somewhere else. The Spirit will lead you. Jesus demonstrates that here. We, begin, we tend to become religious and stuffy and stuck. Look at verse 11, interesting. Then the Pharisees came out, and they began to dispute with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven, testing him. Uh, verse 12, but he sighed deeply in his spirit. And then he said, why does this generation seek a sign? Assuredly. I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation. Stop right there, eyes up here. A few things in these two verses. He gets to the other side. A man has been healed miraculously. People have been provided for powerfully. And all of a sudden, the Pharisees come out to what? Fight him. What in the world? How many of you guys are just trying to do your best right now in your marriage or your singleness or your ministry, and you get attacked by the devil every single day? Anybody but me? I mean, we get attacked. It's crazy. And it surprises me. Why is life so hard sometimes? For two reasons, I'll suggest. Yeah, a couple reasons. The number one reason I'll suggest to you why we get attacked is because the devil's real and he really hates you. You need to hear that because I forget sometimes. Like, why is this temptation happening? Why is this test and trial? Why is this so difficult? Because <laughs> the devil wants to mess you up. These Pharisees come out of nowhere. They just want to fight Jesus. Like, dude, are you, did, you, did you notice that like, we're doing good things? The Pharisees don't care. Number one reason that you get attacked is because the devil's real and he hates you. The number two reason why you get attacked, why things are difficult for you, is because Jesus is real and he loves you. And he wants your faith to go deeper and your character to be refined. 
And I have found that the most effective way is through fire, through tests, difficulties, setback, pushback, failures. I don't like any of those things. I don't like the devil attacking me, and I don't like difficulties coming my way. But I need to not be surprised. As a matter of fact, Peter says, don't be surprised that some fiery trials are coming your way as if it's a strange thing. God's refining your faith, your character. He's growing your roots down and your fruits out. Jesus here, though, is attacked. It shouldn't be a surprise to us, but I'm sometimes taken off guard by the attacks in my life. And Jesus is attacked by these disciples, these Pharisees, and they show up and say, hey, why don't you show us a sign? And Jesus is like, are you for real? You mean like different than the ones I've been doing? Different than the guy that was healed? Different than the 4,000? Different than the five? What are you looking for? And these guys are trying to test the Lord. Maybe they wanted a bigger sign, like an Elijah one, fire from heaven, or some cataclysmic deal. Here's the deal about signs and wonders, though. These guys were trying to fight Jesus, and it grieved him. And he said, no sign will be given to this wicked generation that seeks a sign. Now, let me just kind of speak out of both sides of my mouth. How many of you guys believe in signs and wonders, miracles and power of God? Anybody believe in that? Okay, I believe in that for sure. The signs and the wonders and the miracles and power of God are flowing freely right now. The Holy Spirit has not ceased to be powerful. Gifts are given. 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, all the gifts are there. It's flowing. It's part of our 21st century church model. It's what God's given to us. It does happen. But when we find ourselves developing an unsatiated desire for signs and wonders, man, I just, I want more. I know what God's given to me was pretty cool, but you know what would be cool? Another one. And there's whole groups and denominations and even universities and schools that dedicate themselves to seeking and manifesting signs and wonders and miracles and powers, all of which I believe are active and flowing. But there can be an unhealthy balance if we just want signs, especially when he's already given to us enough signs. Now, let's just humble ourselves. We all like signs, wonders, and miracles. We would love more of them. And all of us have at one point in our life gone on a walk or been in a dark season. We're like, Lord, I just need a sign. And maybe you're out walking in the dark and the sky is clear and you see the stars. You're like, Lord, please just give me a shooting star. Let me know. And you wait for an hour and you see Starlink. I'll take it, you know. <laughs> That'll do <laughs> the Lord. He, whatever. And I've had to repent so many times. Mark writes this and he actually leaves out Jesus' full response. Jesus actually said to these Pharisees, a wicked and imperfect generation asks for a sign. No sign will be given to this generation. And he keeps going. He actually has more words. Mark didn't give it to us because this was written to Gentiles. And what Jesus continued to say, the Gentiles wouldn't care about. It's recorded in the other gospels. You know what Jesus went on to say? No sign will be given to this generation except the sign, well, they're asking for a sign, of Jonah. Now, the Gentiles wouldn't know who Jonah was. The Romans, well, they don't care about Jonah. But when Jesus said that, what he was referring to is the sign of Jonah. There was already a sign given when the prophet Jonah was swallowed by a whale and was dead in the belly for three days. He wrote that. You can write, read it in chapter two of Jonah. He didn't actually die, but he was proverbially dead. And when he was resurrected from that and barfed up on the shores of Nineveh and preached the gospel and they all got saved, Jesus was saying that was a prototype of me of the Savior that would be swallowed up by the earth for three days. It would be resurrected from the earth and would give himself over to salvation to all who would hear the gospel message. Jesus said, you want a sign? There's no, no signs given except the sign of Jonah. In other words, me dying and rising from the dead and people getting saved and having their lives changed, Gentile and Jew, that's all you need. Let's figure that out. Let's freak out for a second. Jesus has given to you and me everything we need to be successful, to be faithful, to be strong, to be steadfast, to be movable, to do the next right thing. And you would be silly to confess that that's not a struggle for you every single day. I wake up, Lord, I, oh man, here we are again, Lord, here we are again, and looking for fresh manna, fresh bread, fresh revelation. And oftentimes it's the exact same thing you had the day before, manna. That time spent with Jesus at the cross I love the fact we take communion here every single Sunday. Every single Sunday, we remember the body. We remember the blood. That's the baseline. Lest we become discouraged and weary in our own souls. It's gonna happen. And I love miracles, and I love when people say, look, the Lord changed my life, and this has happened. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. But what if you didn't get that testimony? What if there wasn't that sign? Is that enough for you? I hope so. 
I want it to be enough for me. I want the Lord to look at my race, look at my fight, look at my life and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your glory. Praise the Lord. And here's the deal. These guys are critics. And to the critic, no amount of evidence or signs will satisfy, period. To the believer, no amount of evidence or signs are necessary. I'm gonna say it again. To the critic, no amount of signs or evidence will satisfy. They're just gonna want more, more, and more. They're not there to grow in faith. But to the believer, no amount of signs or evidence are even necessary. What God has already given to you is enough. When we go on a search for signs and wonders, it doesn't actually, if we encounter them, it doesn't actually produce lasting faith. You know what it does? It actually produces a greater hunger for more signs and wonders. And you start to want more and more and more. I'm gonna tell you right now, you know what produces actual lasting saving faith? Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The word has already been given to us. Jesus here sighs. Look, what does he do next? We're gonna finish this last story. Look at verse 13. And he left them. <laughs> he wasn't there very long with these homies. And he gets in the boat again and departed to the other side. Oh, verse 14, you guys are gonna love this story. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread and they didn't have more than one loaf with them in the boat, these dummies. Can you imagine this? They just came from their own chowder bowl. They got a Moe's restaurant right there. They get in the boat. These guys are trying to fight Jesus. They're in the boat sailing away and someone's like, I'm kind of hungry. And someone's like, did anybody bring any bread? These guys are hilarious. They just can't stop thinking about bread. They got the bread king right there with them. They only got one loaf of bread. This would have been a normal bread loaf, like at Subway. This would have been like a pita pocket, you know, kind of like a little flat bread there, but they only got one of them. Now, I say that to say this. While they're rowing away, guess who's not thinking about bread? Jesus, not even close. These guys, that's all they can stop thinking about. I say that because I wanna to read to you what Jesus says next. He's not thinking about bread at all. He's not thinking about provision, not thinking about sustenance, not thinking about resources, not thinking about all the stuff we worry about. He's on a deeper level. Verse 15, then he charged them saying, hey, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves saying, it's because we don't have bread. <laughs> These guys are so rad. Now, all this is happening internally. Jesus just told them two major truths, careful of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Leaven in the Bible always speaks of sin and a proclivity to sin, something that comes into our lives and then taints us like yeast. We kind of blow the bread up. He says, careful, there's two leavens I want you to be aware of, the leaven of the Pharisees, it'll mess with you, and the leaven of Herod. The leaven of the Pharisees, who he just fought with, is the leaven of religiosity, and false teaching. He said, don't, guys, be careful of that. False teaching and being religious. But also, be careful of the leaven of Herod. Herod was a political puppet, and he was immoral and worldly. And I believe Jesus is saying there's two camps you gotta watch out for, the camp of being religious and false teaching, but also be careful of being too political and looking to those systems in the world. All the while, these guys can't stop but thinking about the bread that they don't have. We should have packed bread. Jesus is gonna use this as a teachable moment. Verse 17, but Jesus being aware of it said to them, why do you reason because you have no bread? Don't you perceive? Don't you understand? Is your heart still hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? Don't you remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of fragments did you take up? They said to him, uh, 12. Also, when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many of bat large baskets full of fragments did you take up? Uh, seven. So we said to them, how is it that you do not understand? Stop right there, eyes up here. Now, I don't want to paint a picture of Jesus being frustrated with his disciples, but I believe he's trying to help them learn a lesson. They can't help but think about the bread and the provision and what's coming next. I can't believe this happened. All the while, who's there? Jesus Christ. He's in the boat with them. And so Jesus is like, hey, are you for real? I'm trying to teach you about the love of the Pharisees and the leaven of the, of the Herodians. You guys, are, do you remember that time there was 5,000 hungry people? Do you remember that? Do you remember that? Yeah, I remember. Okay. And, and what happened? I, 12? Okay, cool. Do you remember just like 25 minutes ago when there's 4,000 people and we had seven baskets? I'm more concerned, Jesus would say, that seeing and hearing and perceiving and remembering that you would walk with me and not miss it I say all that to say to our shame too, we miss it too. 
Every single day we get weird. Every single day we get small. Every single day we get tipped over. Every single day we find ourselves tiptoeing into fear that there's not gonna be enough or finding ourselves religious like the Pharisees or finding ourselves worldly and political like the Herodians. And Jesus is saying, guys, here's the deal. All of this speaks of me, the bread of life, being with you right now. Don't get into any one of these three traps of the worry of the provision, but we don't have enough. I know you don't have enough. I didn't give you enough on purpose, but Lord, we got a big project in South Beach and it's millions and millions and millions of dollars. I know. I'm gonna give it to you when I give it to you. I'm gonna give it to you in creative ways, but Lord, we don't have enough. What do you have? We just have seven loaves. Perfect, give it to me. I'm gonna give it right back and then get to work. And how does it provide, how does it multiply? I don't know. Where does it all come from? I don't know. Obedience. And whether it's a big building in South Beach or maybe it's the situation and issues you're walking through in your life right now. See, the rest of the world, the Pharisees and the Herodians, the people that are not into Jesus and don't know the things of God's kingdom, God's put us right now in the midst of their lives as well that we would be different, that we would be used by God for his glory and for others' good. And I'm gonna have the worship team come up and we're gonna respond and just sing in a song. We're gonna go our way. I've been talking a lot about bread. I bet some of you guys are going to Subway after this probably, you know. I'm gonna ask you guys to stand up and we're gonna pray. I I pray you're encouraged today in light of the unknown. What's going on right now in your life? What, What don't you know? Like just freak out with me a little bit. What don't you know? Probably a lot. I hope there's a lot you don't know. Man, I don't know who I'm gonna marry. Maybe you're single. I don't know who I'm gonna marry. Freaking out about it, okay? Give that to the Lord. Give you, delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. Bring those thoughts to him. Lord, I, I, I'm, I'm worried about my spouse. I'm worried about my career. Lord, I'm worried about my health. Maybe you have a health issue, right? I don't know what's gonna happen. I don't know how it's gonna happen. Maybe you're married already and your marriage is going through some challenges. How, how are we gonna restore this? How are we gonna navigate through this? Maybe you have kids and your kids are getting to that age right now where you're concerned for them. Like, oh no, they're making their own decisions. You don't know the future. God has made it that way on purpose. And he's in the boat with you. And he's been so faithful every step of the way. And he wants us to believe. His compassion for you is limitless. His patience for you. You ever been part of a big seminar or maybe a big teaching session? And you just hope that the instructor, the teacher doesn't actually make eye contact with you? It's like every day for me in school every day and yet the teacher the master shepherd he, he, he weaves through the rest of the students and he comes to you he says this is the lesson I'm teaching you Luke I'm right here with you this is what I want you to receive this is for you it's, it's every one of us here he wants us to believe that he is enough he's gonna provide And he doesn't want us to grow weary and therefore become discouraged and therefore become selfish and therefore become prejudiced and we find ourselves becoming small. He says, I'm not that way. My pastor taught me a saying years and years ago that if you do the motion, God will provide the emotion. If you do what God has said to do, that's the motion, obedience. Lord, I don't know if I have enough to give to my spouse. I don't know if I have enough to give to my neighbors. I don't know if I have enough to give out. You don't. But he's told us to by faith. And if you do the motion, Lord, I'm just gonna step out. I'm gonna do what you said to do. I'm gonna gonna make these people sit down and give them seven loaves. This is gonna be stupid. You start to distribute what God has broken, what God has thanked, what God has given back to you. And it's like, holy smokes, I'm doing the motion. And now the emotion, the provision, the power is here. God has not called us to normal lives. He's called us to supernatural lives. He's not called us to be like the Pharisees who are faking it or the Herodians who are blowing it. He's called us to be those men and women who trust him to hear his voice. It's gonna take faith. It's gonna take obedience. It's gonna take cooperation and participation. So here's what I wanna do. I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes. We're gonna give an opportunity to respond right now. Father, as we now sing a song and go our way, before so, we need to receive from you your power and provision and your peace. So for my friends that are here this afternoon, if you're here and you want to be this man or woman who's used by God to distribute his goodness, his kindness, his wealth, his riches, 
and you're limited and you know it and you have a resource problem, but you know your God does not. He's the bread king. He is it all. And you would simply say, Lord, I want to do this, but I need your help. Lord, I want to be used by you, but I need your help. If that's you, if it's that simple, Lord, I want to do this, but I need your help. Would you just raise up your hands right now? Just say, Lord, I want to do this, but I need your help. And put your hands up and say, yes, Lord, by way of surrender. Lord, I want to do this, but I need your help. Lord, I fear that I'll fail again. I'll feel, I fear that I'll come up short. I fear that my prejudice or my selfishness or my weariness will get in the way. I want to do this, but I need your help. And my hands are up too, Jesus. I surrender. Would you forgive me? Forgive us. Fill us, Lord, with overflowing baskets, even once again today. We need you, Holy Spirit, to do these things. And as we sing this song to you, may you be honored. And as those who come forward for prayer, may they come forward for prayer and receive, Lord, healing and ministry. We thank you, God, for all you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's sing this song. If you need prayer, there's prayer people coming up on the left and right. Come have somebody pray for you, and let's sing to the Lord together.